thank you all for coming. I have, um, we have some really lovely insights and uh, discussions planned and a new interactive format that we're trying out, so I'll explain that in a minute. But first, a big welcome from the New School and from Fulbright's New York chapter to our Women in Tech quantifying the impact of the arts through big data events. Thank you all. I would like to introduce very briefly the panelists and then they'll go ahead and give their own introductions. So, um, first of all, I am Josephine Dorado. Hello to all of you. I'm the president of Fulbright's New York chapter, as well as a professor here in the Media Studies School at the New School, and a State Department trainer and an artist myself. Going down the line from farthest to closest, we have Deborah Anderson, our panelist, who is also the designer of the Big Data Consumer Research course, course here at the New School and the co-founder of Culture Shock and Stereo Projects. And she'll be talking about her experience building prototypes for data visualization applications and data-driven approaches to immersive experiences. Rebecca Davis, right next to her, is our Fulbright New York alumna in residence and the executive director of Mind Leaps. And Mind Leaps is a company that creates dance and educational programs for street children in post-conflict and developing countries. And what's interesting about what they're doing is that they're utilizing a kinesthetic dance-based curriculum to improve the cognitive development of youth. So that's really interesting. She'll be talking about a back-end data application that correlates cognitive skill development in relation to arts education that they've been working on in collaboration with Drexel University and Carnegie Mellon. Christiana Paul um, is the adjunct curator of New Media Arts at the Whitney Museum, and she is also an associate dean here at the New School in the School of Media Studies. And she is a longtime curator, and will be talking about the overlap of art and data, database aesthetics, including database as cultural and aesthetic form, and an overarching view of some of the insights gleaned through different data artworks. Okay, last but not least is Anjali Dejmukka, and she is also a Fulbright alumna and the Director of Knowledge and Communications at the Nonprofit Finance Fund, and they've been doing some interesting things with a survey analyzer created specifically to synthesize data on arts and culture. So she'll be talking a little bit about that. Um, but without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, Jennifer Connor uh, from Institute of International Education on board, and she's gonna to talk to you just briefly about the Fulbright program, which is our flagship international exchange program and the reason why we're all sitting here. Come on up, Jennifer. everyone. Um, it's so nice to see all of your faces here. I just wanted to give a brief shout out. Um, my name is Jennifer Connor and I work for the Fulbright Program um, here at the Institute of International Education in New York. And we administer the Fulbright Program on behalf of the U.S. Department of State. So I work par particularly on the outreach team. So I'm here to kind of recruit some of you um, to apply for the Fulbright Program. Um, and we have two types of grants. So we have study research programs and also English teaching assistantships. Um, so this is a postgraduate year abroad, fully funded by the U.S. Department of State. Um, so if any of you are interested in applying for the Fulbright program, come find me um, after the presentation. Um, and this program is an opportunity to be abroad for a full year um, and sort of better explore and be a cultural ambassador for the United States. Thank you. Okay, so um, as Jennifer mentioned, I just, I mean, I myself and some of my Fulbright colleagues probably can't mention enough like how watershed of a time a Fulbright is, but also like you're just never too old to do one. So if there's some place you want to go in the world to do something that you love, you should look into Fulbright. Um, okay, so just a little bit about our chapter. If you go to FulbrightNY.org, that is where you can connect with um, our different chapter resources. Uh, a link to our New York Fulbrighters Facebook group is there. If you don't belong to our mailing list already, that has announcements about these events that we have. We also have monthly salons and other kinds of um, other kinds of events. But you can connect with us on our mailing list and on our Facebook group on FulbrightNY.org. Uh, Fulbright.org is where the National Association has their resources, and as Jennifer mentioned, if you are interested in applying for Fulbright or know somebody that should, you can also check out that site as well. If you're tweeting or Facebooking or anything, please hashtag Fulbright, hashtag Women in Tech. Okay, so just a little explanation about what the format is. Um, this format is, is very, it's really great for um, getting more 
audience-driven Q&A. So rather than just doing sort of the regular format of like, does somebody have a question, here's an answer, what we've done is we've printed out these signs and it's sourced from IDEO, um, an agency here in New York that has been doing some really interesting work with uh, design research. And basically on each side of it, you'll see either a conf green confirm or a dark blue complicate. And the green confirm is if you are agreeing with somebody's point or insight, then you say you agree, you confirm. Okay, so um, the other side is I'm not sure, I don't agree, or it's complicated. Um, so that's what that the blue side is for. So just let's take a little, little test here. Um, if I say something like the sky is blue, then Okay, so there are some interesting, you know, there are some, okay, so the fellow who's holding up the complicate there, yes, um, yes, so, so yeah, so if you could just say, and here's where I would ask somebody in the Q&A section to run a mic over and I'd say, okay, the sky isn't, you don't agree with the sky is blue, why is that? Exactly, right? So, so there's an example of why you might hold out a complicate or a confirm. Most of them are green, there are a couple of complicates. So um, occasionally during the whole dialogue of this, um, we'll be pointing out certain insights and statements and asking you to either confirm or to complicate. And you can back that up with why you're confirming or why you're complicating the issue. So that's what those signs are for, so keep them ready. Okay. Um, I went ahead and I briefly introduced everybody, but if we could just go down the line with Anjali coming, coming on up and just uh, describing a little bit about that survey analyzer that we talked about. Um, so my name is Anjali. Um, I am director of knowledge and communications at the nonprofit finance fund. We do um, a variety of different things in the nonprofit sector. First off, we're a community development financial institution, so we give loans to nonprofits including arts organizations across the country. Um, we are also a financial advisor and a consultant. Um, we work with government, policy, um, and policy analysts, um, foundations, and nonprofits to influence the way that money flows into the nonprofit sector. And my department specifically works on research projects. Um, so what I'm gonna he here to talk to you guys today specifically about is our nonprofit state of the sector survey. Um, it's one of our Key, key sort of data gathering efforts um, for the nonprofit sector. And um, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about how we run the survey. Um, first off, because we are a practitioner, we work with nonprofits across the country. What we do typically in our survey process is develop hypotheses around what is going on in the nonprofit sector. We use that to craft questions based on what we're seeing on the ground. Um, then we craft those into questions, we, we put out the survey, we do a massive drive across the country. Um, this year we got 5,400, approximately 5,400 organizations across the country, 900 of which were arts and culture. Um, and then we spend the rest of the year, from now towards the end of the year, deep, doing deep dives into the survey, into subsets of the data, so that we can actually support systemic change. And we use the data to enable policy change across the country, we work with state associations, with the government, and so forth, that take that data and put it into people's hands who can use it to actually affect change in the sector. Um, one of the tools that um, Jason, Josephine particularly wanted me to talk about today with you all is our survey analyzer. We have worked with um, a variety of developers to take that survey data and put it online and to empower communities across the country to filter it however they want um, based on a variety of metrics from state, sector, operating expense, lifeline, whether they identify as a lifeline organization, um, i.e. providing critical services to communities in need, um, and they can basically take take and slice and dice this data and do whatever they want with it effectively to support their own local needs. Um, we are currently working on upgrades to this to add some nuance to how people can use it for analysis. Um, but this is the main tool where you all can go and actually look at the survey data yourself. So I'm gonna do a really quick run through of our um, arts findings specifically focused on impact measurement. Um, as you can just see from this slide very quickly, we had a lot of uh, diverse respondents across a lot of different sectors. Um, it's a very wide cross section. Um, and we asked a variety of specific questions around impact measurement. Um, the first being, do you collect output data? 
Um, for those of you who are in the sector and work on it, the term output effectively means the volume of a program's activities. Number of seats filled in a homeless shelter would be the number of beds filled. These are sort of outputs of a program, the volume of what they're doing. And as you can see, arts, and, arts organizations and non-arts equivalently are pretty comp much comparable when we're talking about measuring volume um, of outputs. But the field is changing, and the funding environment is changing. Um, in the past, you know, outputs were enough. We were really focused on outputs across the sector. Whether you were a homeless shelter or an arts organization, outputs was really the primary means through which people could measure the impact of their programs. People were paying for services based on those outputs. And most people who were providing funding in the environment were actually motivated more by altruism. Um, now, we're in a, when it, sort of state of the sector where people are paying for what works. They want to know how, what the impact of an organization's services are on a community. They want to see proof of that. And they're more motivated by actually trying to see how the money that they're putting in to these causes is actually causing change in the sector. Um, so that's kind of where we're, we're currently at that, that phase. Um, so I'm going to kind of walk a little bit very briefly to you, with, with you through how organizations are going about making that transition from focusing on outputs to producing models to help them take what they want, what they want to know about the impact of their services and test it to see whether it's actually working or not. What you're seeing here, I won't go into very great detail on this, is basically the framework for how you go about creating a logic model or a theory of change for a nonprofit. Um, this is what a lot of organizations, whether your arts or not, are starting to do more. Um, I won't go through the definitions, but effectively the main difference here is that outputs focus on the volume and outcomes focus on what meaningful indicators of change are happening in communities. So behavior change, um, for example, for a hospital that might be um, whether a preventive service resulted in a reduction in the rate of diabetes in a community. Um, and then they would basically, within this theoretical framework or this theory of change, they would look at particular sets of data, indicators, to actually identify what are the measures that we need to collect and how do we need to collect them to rather assess whether our programs are working and actually doing what we, be we believe they are. Um, and so we asked this in our survey, these two questions around do you have a theory of change and, a, and do you collect outcomes data? And you can see here that um, the numbers are starting to shift a little. Arts organizations are a little bit behind non-arts organizations in these measures um, for a very you know, good reason. It's a lot harder for organizations to measure impact. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that at the end if I have time, um, but otherwise we can, we can skip to the <laughs> next one. Um, but I wanted to just quickly focus a little bit on this one last thing um, before I might get um, moved on, which is that we're now in a, a period of history where the field is changing again. And in this part of what's happening in the field, t actually outcomes are being tied to financing. Um, NFF sits in a particular place in the sector where we are looking at that shift and we are very much involved in looking at how financial instruments are effectively being created to tie the funding to whether a program actually works, contingent on whether a program actually works. This is a significant shift in how the, the sector, the social sector is going to be funded and in how organizations like arts organizations will be, will remain competitive or have challenges in comparison to some of their peers like homeless services organizations and healthcare organizations who are further along on that path towards outcomes measurement. So um, I am going to wrap it up, but um, we can talk a little bit more in the Q&A if you guys are interested in um, doing so on some of the other issues around what are really the most sophisticated organizations doing in terms of measuring impact. Thank you, Anjali. And don't worry, we'll be hearing a lot more about that. This is just like a, you know, an overview and we can get more into the meat of some of that survey and the findings in the Q&A. And next up, Christiana Paul. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit less about quantifying the impact of the arts per se than the notion of quantifying and qualifying in the context of uh, cultural narratives from the small data of the database to big data. 
So the database arrived on the cultural scene as a symbolic uh, form, as Lev Manovich would put it, uh, pretty much in the 90s. And what we understood by database aesthetics was mostly the aesthetic principles applied in imposing the logic of the database to any type of information, the filtering of data collections or uh, visualizing data, not the aesthetics of the database with its tables um, as a data container. So database aesthetics um, can be seen as a conceptual potential and cultural form and as a way of revealing visual patterns of knowledge, beliefs, and social behavior. One of the iconic pieces um, of the early 2000s was George Legrady's Pockets Full of Memories, a project in which um, visitors to a museum, in this case the Centre Pompidou, would scan one of the items in their pockets, rank them according to certain criteria, valuable or not, material, and they were then uh, positioned on a map through the use of a Cohonan algorithm. And what this became was basically an exploration and investigation of the personal value of objects, a very cheap object that could hold a high personal value that was um, depicted in this visualization. Now we have moved on to big data projects such as Lev Manovich and his teams on Broadway, uh, now on view at the public library here, in which they used over uh, half a million of Instagram photos, I think um, eight million um, Foursquare check-ins, and a lot of other social media materials to basically create a portrait of Broadway that you can walk through and investigate. So the focus here has switched from small data to big data. This is also something that Manovich and his team explored in the project Photo Trails. Um, what you see here are images from Tel Aviv. Many of them are in his um, representations organized by you, for example, and time of day. He did something uh, similar for Sandy. So what you see here is basically a radial view of the time, then you and saturation. You see the line of the blackout. You see increases of um, the data. And what he has been arguing for is that you can basically get to uh, thickness of data through um, anthropological and larger cultural insights without losing the view of the individual. So large data has also been used in curating through um, crowdsourced exhibitions. Uh, the Brooklyn Museum did this in its um, exhibition Click. And then we also have used the database a lot in preservation and archiving, both the database and big data, actually. So the database can become a structure for archiving art and its context, uh, such as the Wayback Machine, or as a structure for archiving metadata about art and preservation approaches. So the Google Art Project at this point is still a rather small collection. Um, there are 545 collections in it, um, 11,000 artwork um, artists and artworks. So it is a smaller collection, but they also see this as an attempt in documenting and preservation. A very different approach using big data was a preservation initiative that we took, uh, undertook at the Whitney a couple of years ago, and I don't want to get into um, any details of the initiative. This was um, Douglas Davis' website, the world's first collaborative sentence in which people basically endlessly contribute to a sentence, and as you can imagine, one thing that you have to deal with in an older web project is link rock. A lot of the links were broken. So we um, were asking ourselves, what are we doing with this? Do we leave them gone as a testament to the ephemeral nature of the web, or do we go to the Wayback Machine and reconstruct it? And we ended up doing two versions of it. So if you look at page five of the sentence, for example, you find a link to the White House. And that, of course, was never broken. But if you go back to the Wayback Machine, you can literally enter a time tunnel and look at this um, project throughout um, different times. You know, the first virtual library, the Clinton-Gore administration, the Bush administration, and um, the Obama administration. So I'm, I have a lot more, but perhaps I can get into it later. 
I'll take one more minute. So I think what is really important here are the provocations um, for big data that we have to look at. And Dana Boyd and Kate Crawford have um, raised a lot of uh, important questions here. Automating research changes the definition of knowledge. I'm not going to go through all of them. Big, bigger data are not always better data. All, not all data are equivalent. All of these are very important to um, keep in mind. And I'll end it with just a few examples of where things um, fail. If you think about the potentially big data at some point of the Google Art um, project, Many of these images in the gallery views are actually not depicted due to rights issues. So um, Erica Love and Joao Insuto have done a really nice project in which they actually took the blurred out images of the Google Art Project, uh, printed them out, and put them into shows. So these are some of the artworks you would encounter in Google. Lev Manovich also did comparisons between um, artists, and you're looking at Mondrian versus Rothko in terms of you. That again raises the question, where are these images coming from? Are they color calibrated? Martin Wattenberg and Fernanda Viegas did um, a very nice project, I'll end with that, where they actually constructed artworks and images out of their representations online and then Hockney style put them together. So what you're looking at here is Man Ray as 21 Tears would appear on the web in a variety of different shades and um, the reason for the jagged edges is that images are cropped in wild ways. So if we're doing analysis using big data, using social media data, we have to ask a variety of questions before we can assess the impact of any of this or derive uh, larger cultural knowledge. I'll end it here and we can discuss further. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That was a great overview. Next up, we have Rebecca Davis. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, maybe a little bit higher. Okay, good evening. Uh, let's start with a short video. profit organization that works in post-conflict in developing countries. So these are the kids that we work with. And we work in two countries in Africa, in Guinea and in Rwanda, and in one country in the Balkans, Bosnia-Herzegovina. So all of the kids that you see in these video clips, they're homeless. So they're street kids. So some of them are street kids because they're orphans, and in many cases, they are living on the street because their parents simply cannot provide food for them. The poverty is so extreme that they decide to live on the street instead. So the kids look pretty normal here, but actually when they start our program, they're not so much like this. This is several weeks into the program. When they come, they're used to living on the, the street, so they're used to trying to fight for survival every single day. So they beg and steal and fight for food. Now we have the challenge of making them normal kids so that they can be reintegrated into their communities. So a typical kid would be Patrick. Patrick decided that instead of living here with his mother, who's a survivor of the 1994 genocide in Rwanda, and his little brother, that he would rather live on the street. Patrick is one of the kids that we have to transform to go to this place. This is a boarding school in Rwanda. So now Patrick is actually third from your right in this photo, and that's Patrick after two years in boarding school. So how does this transformation take place? So with Mind Leaps, we've developed a three-phase model to approach this. We take kids from the street and we say, hey kids, come to our center and take a dance class. You know, we're working in communities where the kids love to dance. So we say, okay, just come to our center and take a dance class. It'll be fun. 
but actually the purpose of the dance class is to change their behavior and to change their cognitive development. When we see those skills start to change, then we move them into the second phase. This is vocational training. So this is either computer skills or English literacy. And then the top kids are sponsored to go to boarding school in their own country. And that's really the full solution for these kids because now they finally have three meals a day, they have clothes to wear, they have a full education, they have medical insurance, everything they need to be a typical kid. So then this begs the question as an organization, okay, what we need to do is we need to measure the kids in the dance program. We need to know when does their cognitive and behavioral skills develop to the point where we can put them in the second phase, vocational training. So how do we do that? We're running a dance class. So what we decided to do is target 11 specific skills. So these are somewhat on the mental side and somewhat on the social side. So we have skills like memorization, concentration, commitment or grit, and then we have more of the social skills, respect and tolerance, teamwork and collaboration, self-esteem, creativity. And what we have to do is track how these skills improve in each of the kids. So we're using a kinesthetic based approach. We're completely in the world of dance. So what we decided to do was to create a rubric for each of these skills from one to 10. So let's say we're in memorization. Okay, how are we gonna measure memorization through movement? Well, if we have something really simple like stamp, clap, stamp, clap, and we do this several times in our class, and the kids still can't do stamp, it's, you know, it turns out clap, clap, stamp, clap, no, stamp, clap. Okay, well that kid is gonna score a one today. But the goal is that eventually he would score a 10 and a 10 in memorization in our rubric is that he can retain a large sequence of choreography and a style of movement that he hasn't even seen before. And that's when we know the child is actually progressing in terms of the skill of memorization. So what we've done is we've collected this data and we've started to plot and see the impact of it. So this is our learning curve for one of the groups of our kids. So you can see in the first like 15 classes, there's quite a steep improvement. And then it still improves and then there's a saturation point. In this particular graph, the blue line is the fit line and the black line is the actual data points, the averages. In this particular graph, you see our younger kids. So you can see actually the, the slope is very different. The slope is much less but the, the saturation point will actually be higher than in the other group. And then we have our specific skills. We can see that in the first three months, that's the key component of our program, and then through six months, there's still improvement. So as an organization, we know after about six months on average, the kids should move on to vocational training. So this has been a collaborative effort with Carnegie Mellon and Drexel. Carnegie Mellon has built the data application that allows us to collect this data and create these graphs. And Drexel is now doing a mixed method study so we can add in the qualitative component and really look at the development. The ultimate goal of this study is a website that we'll produce by the end of the year that will showcase how we did the analysis and what our findings are. It'll have the different graphs for our different groups of kids as well as the skills. And it'll also have individual profiles so we can look at how a particular student is doing in the program. So the ultimate goal of something like this is to create a study where we can show that the arts are not just something that's fun for the kids to do, but it's actually a critical tool in transforming them from living on the street to becoming successful students. Thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, Deborah Anderson. everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm a professor here as well at, at the New School for Public Engagement. I designed a course around big data and consumer research in 2013. Um, it's uh, going to be um, recurring again in the fall of this year. Um, I'm also the founder of Culture Shock. We've been in New York for about seven years and focus on innovation and arts and culture and technology and also now as a women in technology entrepreneur starting a new company that is a virtual reality production studio um, that will be focusing on data visualization uh, called Stereo Projects. 
I um, wanted to talk a little bit in my intro just a bit about um, kind of the art of information, um, kind of something that emerged out of our work in our studio and looking at, you know, what is kind of data and how do we draw insights from data um, across many different uh, cross-platforms through understanding art and culture and both kind of quantitative and qualitative um, Overlay. So this is just some of the, the work we've done over the last few years, kind of jumping from fine art into film festival and kind of new media, and is very much a kind of hybrid of this new media space um, leading into the work I'm currently researching, which is virtual reality. Um, to give you an idea of kind of the, the, the work that has inspired me as a practitioner, including Christian Paul and Lev Manovich's work, um, has been work with the National Film Board of Canada, uh, Interactive Studio. Um, is anyone familiar with this project, Bear 71? One person, okay, great. Um, well, this project debuted at Sundance in 2012 at the New Frontier uh, storytelling pro uh, program, and it was really profound to me to, uh, to see and understand how empathy can be created through data-driven storytelling, um, using the creative use of technology, using augmented reality, using uh, interactive 20-minute documentary, um, as well as playing on, on ideas of surveillance in both the um, animal world and our kind of human world of surveillance, and playing that back at, towards us through a um, interactive, uh, immersive experience online. So from here in our studio, we kind of looked at, you know, generative art and animation, things that we've been working in a lot, but looking at this, which is a work with generative processing code language by an artist named Glenn Marshall, who won the Ars Electronica in 2009 for computer art, um, what you're looking at is a, a work of art that is essentially created and generated with ones and zeros. Um, Glenn is you know, teaching the computer to create its own generative art pieces. We thought, let's talk about real-time data, and perhaps we can take um, an API from, in this case, Gizmodo's top 10 news articles and visualize something like a word cloud in a new way through a moving image, immersive data visualization experience. So have these videos online as well. The next experiment uh, recently has been working uh, again with the National Film Board of Canada for the Tribeca Film Festival here in New York for a project called Do Not Track, um, which everyone here is probably pretty aware and around the issues around privacy and the web economy and surveillance. So we took this project into an installation, an art installation at a film festival, an adaptation of that, and to better understand um, how effective this documentary, this uh, interactive documentary that's seven episodes over the course of uh, several weeks, um, would have on an audience both interacting in the installation environment as well as online worldwide. And I think there were something like 90,000 participants within the first uh, days it was launched. We also created a data literacy survey um, in, in collaboration with um, Harvard uh, Pop Center with a, a data coordinator there. And we generated over 800 um, responses to that survey. So collecting that data within the installation experience was um, a kind of new experiment. And you see in the bottom right is actually an immersive theater performance where we emphasized further through kind of some elements of immersive theater design fiction around the components of, um, of these issues around data and privacy. Now getting into virtual reality a bit more, this, this uh, space is incredibly fascinating to me as an area of research and understanding through the arts, the Im social and cultural impact that the arts can have, um, not just kind of on a one-to-one -one level, but in many ways in looking at you know, shared humanity on a global sense, but starting with these individual artistic um, experiments using virtual reality to understand the other person in deeper ways. Um, two other projects very briefly. I'll wrap up. Um, the other is the enemy, which is a kind of uh, putting yourself in between two combatant fighters in a virtual or space. Again, driving at building empathy through virtual reality. And finally, sound self, which is really a game that's meeting technology and virtual reality and looking at a future where um, it's not a game at all. It's potentially something other, a kind of combination of self and software. Um, and finally, there'll, there'll be a, a new uh, virtual reality film that's playing into many ways around computer programming and software and 360 um, video with, with this piece by Glenn Marshall coming out in June. Thank you.
Thank you. I'm just going to unsleeve that. Great. So that gives you some oversight on sort of like, you know, just, we're just tapping the surface of everything, and the, these are all really good angles and very different angles of many different projects um, and insights around that. So from here, I actually I heard a lot of really great points in that um, thought and thoughts. Um, I want to start off with just asking the question about um, how we're defining big data, like when does it get big? And um, we're also looking at different case studies and, for example, the New York City cultural data set. And um, if it's not big, then how do you scale? Like, how do you look at a different pro project and scale it out? And Christiana, you mentioned that bigger data is not always better data. So I feel like that's related. And um, can you speak towards that? Why is, in your opinion, bigger data not always better data? Um, it's, it's not only my opinion. Right. <laughs> I think yes. there has been quite a bit of research um, into that. So scalability is um, really key here and not all data is in fact um, scalable. So just because you have more data sources does not necessarily mean that you arrive at, more, at better and more accurate um, conclusions. Um, Dana Boyd again also used a very simple e counter example where um, one study followed one worker through a day. And what could be yielded from that very focused data set was actually much, much more than from a large data set of workers in general. So I think we're just at the beginning of figuring out what questions to ask about data and how to really deal with um, data sets that do not fit um, the database as a tool anymore and have to be searched by means of different uh, tools. Right, and right. I guess every data set would be different. So I realize my answer is a little bit vague, but it also depends on what data you're looking at, how it has been gathered, you know, and all the specifics surrounding it. Good, good. So I would just say to restate that, um, uh, that as far as bigger data not always being better data is that the data isn't always scalable, right? And that you can't always dive deeply into the data and certainly in some cases you do want to dive deeply and it always depends on the data. So I would say this is our first opportunity to either confirm or complicate. So if the panelists could also hold up whether you confirm or complicate, you agree the green side or disagree the purple side. Oh, wow. Okay, so of, oh, interesting. There are quite a few. Okay, so I would say, um, um, Deborah, uh, why is it complicated? Big data is very complicated. <laughs> I think the one thing that um, is, you know, the more data you have, the, the more complex that data set or sets, um, the more insights you can draw from that data. But I think, um, you know, kind of countering on database form and, and these other things, I think also that idea of critical thinking and what, what, are you look, what are you asking the data? I think always starting with that very simple mm -hmm. question, um, I think we can feel right now, you know, there's so, data is just infinitely, exponentially um, expanding and it's overwhelming and the technology is moving much faster. I think it's very important to continue to have a lens of critical thinking into the questions. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in a lot of the, the, how things are measured in terms of impact and, and these funding avenues because um, you know, at the end of the day, you have to work in, a, in, a, in our uh, world right now where, where we're just really inundated with um, all potential aspects of data collection or storytelling with data and that kind of thing. Um, so I think it does come back to the simplicity too of big data around the, what questions you're looking to ask. And just to very uh, yeah. briefly add to that, I, um, I completely agree. We often think of data as passive, and then the research we perform on it as active, and that's absolutely not true, because the data collection itself and where that data is coming from is a very active process, and that already creates a bias, always. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that is a really, really good point to bring up, is that that data isn't passive, that there's a bias in the actual data collection. So um, let's hear from the audience now, um, from anyone who would confirm or complicate about the actual data collection. So the gentleman, Katie's going to bring you a microphone. Hi, uh, Hi. my name is Chris. 
Hi, Chris. Um, so, yeah, I absolutely agree with actually uh, both those comments because, I mean, I read an article last year saying that a lot of these companies, they're gathering um, mountains and mountains of this data and they don't know what to do with it. And so they're looking for like mathematicians to figure out how they can analyze the data to come up with some actual critically important uh, questions to answer because uh, they don't know what they have basically. So I think, I, I just want to say that I, I, can, I agree with that, um, that you know, we have these companies just taking whatever they can but not really knowing, not knowing what to do with it uh, and so they're just sitting on it. So um, I think once we can get to a point where we have more critical thinking, um, maybe, maybe even more like mathematicians or, or other types of thinkers doing this, there'll be a lot of uh, um, like back analysis of all the data that has already been collected over these past you know, 10, 15 years or whatnot. And we might be seeing trends going on that were right before our eyes, but we didn't even know they existed. Right, thank you, Chris. I think that's a really good point to, be, to bring up and I think it plays into uh, the points that you all were bringing up too and that was actually one of my next questions is um, sort of looking at this overwhelming use of data analysis across sectors in not only arts but in journalism and other sectors as well um, in evaluation, how do, you do, how do we deal with the integrita, integrity of the data interpretation? Just because there's a chart with a line going up doesn't necessarily mean that that point is true. It just means that there's a chart with a line going up and certainly you can make the data look however you want it to look. So what kinds of methodology and balances and checks should we have in place for making sure we have integrity of those interpretations? I have, a, I have a, a comment on that. It's, you know, it's interesting because nonprofit finance fund. We, we're a financial consultant, and we look at data all day long. And you know, a lot of folks come to us and say, "Okay, well, what's the right number we should be looking for when we want to assess an organization's financial effectiveness, or what's the right metric we should use to assess whether they're actually using the money that we give them well?" And we always say. It's complicated, <laughs> speaking of, <laughs> and that it's, it's not an answer, it's a question. And so, you know, because we're a consultant, we often go into these meetings where or funders want an answer. They want to use the data to come up with an answer. And we say, no, this is a starting point for a conversation to be had. It's a far more nuanced issue. And so I, the reason I'm saying this is that in the context of data, people sometimes forget the qualitative angle and the importance of that qualitative lens when you look at the data. We're never going to have a perfect data set. There's no such thing. <laughs> you can look at financial data all day. You can have the perfect set of audited financials in front of you. But the reality is, without that additional layer of context and conversation and dialogue, you will always fail. You will always fail to come up with an analysis that you know, you can really conclusively, you know, build out into a decision-making process. Mm -hmm. And to add to that, I think it's very often a point of correlating data sets, because again, as you say, there is no blanket answer to anything. You have to look at the respective data you have and ask questions about what else might correlate to that. And that will be different from data set to data set, from sector to sector. Yeah. So there simply is no answer to, oh, what questions do we ask about data or what is the methodology? We def need to develop methodologies for specific data sets too. Yeah. And I think too, I, I know you want to say something, Rebecca. Um, I think sort of the, the, the importance of having that qualitative lens is, is certainly there, but I think that also begs the question is, if we put a qualitative lens on it, then how does that happen and then it, of course, becomes slightly subjective. So I think that there's, there's it's like it's 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 complicated. <laughs> um, Rebecca, you wanted to say something towards it. Yeah, I mean, like so, from an organization standpoint, I think it's very similar to what Angelie is saying: is that we have to accept the fact that as we undertake these data findings, that we're going to end up with questions that weren't in our original set of questions. Like, for example, for my organization, when we started measuring these skills, then we introduced a meal program halfway through. And we wanted to see if these skills would improve more when we're actually feeding the kids. 
And we found out, it, no, it doesn't, <laughs> which is shocking to us. So now we have to go back and we have to assess, okay, did we do that data collection properly? And if we did, why would that not be showing the intended result we expect? So I think the, the fact that it's an ongoing process has to not only be accepted by the funders, which we would love them to accept, uh, but also by the organizations themselves. And if you're uncovering new questions, you have to be willing to now dig deeper. Yeah, thank you. So I'm gonna take one of the questions that was put into our little insight box here from an audience member. Um, since impact of the arts is not completely quantifiable, how are the social and emotional, social and emotional aspects represented in data? I think they, they always are, but it's, again, tricky and complicated to, um, to get to them. So the George Legrady project that I briefly showed actually tried to do something like that and getting to emotional um, layers within a specific data set um, that was being created. I think together with different disciplines such as you know, psychologists and sociologists, you might be able to um, develop a set of very good questions to get to emotional uh, impact and um, do a service, um, a sur service survey um, about that. You know. um, but again, it also will very much depend on what the artworks are, in what context they are being um, experienced. Is it an institution? Is it public art? You know? I mean, all of those different layers need to be assessed. Um, I'm going to pause here and just uh, get a measure on the audience here as far as the social and emotional aspects are represented. Do you confirm or complicate that this also depends on the questions that they are represented, social and emotional aspects are represented in data, you just have to have critical thinking around the questions that are being asked? Okay. Lizzie, how about you? <laughs> Well, I'll make mine brief. I just think it, it can be complicated by a survey when you can't really, if you're asking a multiple choice question, let's say, and you're asking how did you feel, and there's five choices, and you pick one of those five choices, you really can't define it. Or if someone's answering a question that's an open-ended question, they might not say everything they're, they're feeling in that emotion. So I think it's very hard to quantify that. It does depend on the survey questions you're asking, and if you're asking them in a basic format or if you're talking to someone, then that also gauges how, you know, how you're reacting, how the person's answering their questions, if they're very comfortable and emotional about it, or they're reserved. So it, it all it depends on how you're collecting the data, I think. Thank you. Can I add? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, I that's absolutely true in our case because we have a lot of kids that don't talk um, for, <laughs> for multiple reasons. Um, but they're not going to be open with us about their emotions, especially if we're outsiders who are interviewing them. Uh, so for us, we've had to be forced to find other ways of trying to collect that psychosocial data. For us, it's through movement and through creating a rubric that we can balance on the choreography component of our class. But if we were relying on our kids to say, like, I'm happy today, I'm not happy today, we can't get that information out of them. Yeah. And that also um, your comment points to one of the basic issues that one always struggles with. If you give pre-configured answers, then it will, of course, become much, much easier to, in the end, correlate categories and arrive at conclusions, but you miss a lot. And if you leave it wide open and everybody can express their emotions, the result it will yield becomes uh, much, much more blurry. Yeah, so. I have a, a quick comment on that. Um, on our survey, we asked two questions. We asked, um, what is, do you have a theory of change and do you collect outcomes um, data? We don't actually know whether people understand what the word outcomes mean, so we use the theory of change question as a sort of correlating indicator because we know that theory of change is an indicator for organizations that are capturing outcomes data. So, I'll just give you an example. Same thing is often done on the emotional side. What are correlating activities or behaviors that, that are indicators of an emotional state? So that's what psychologists often do that as, an, as a sort of proxy. Yeah, and just to add to, I think, emerging technologies and, and some of the art, uh, artists um, that are creating new, I think new, the artists themselves look to the artists and the investigators that are, I think, formulating new methodologies for data visualization and interpretation of the um, qualitative side and quanti um, quantitative side through um, 
using technologies like uh, sensors and um, biofeedback components. I mean, there's really rich data you can now actually collect on emotional response in combination with traditional social science and survey questions and, and kind of before and after. But to your point, it's very much about the context. I think always framing the aspect of that um, survey or the understanding of, of uh, pre and post kind of uh, survey of, for example, when we presented the art installation and the data survey or a virtual reality survey, you know, that can be skewed based on the context of the installation environment, something very, you know, kind of broad and vague. So I think constantly uh, getting very granular in assessing that data and working in uh, research groups to uh, and partnerships to continue continuously evaluate and have critical thinking around that. Thank you, um, Chris. I saw you holding up very enthusiastically your complicate sign. <laughs> I, uh, no, I, I I think the validity of how. Uh, the validity of like a question that's asked, like how truthful is it, I think depends on the environment. Like on the one hand, like if, like in Rebecca's case, if you're asking a kid, like, are you happy? There's a lot that goes into that. You know, maybe it's like social pressure or like subconscious pressure. But there was a, there was like a Google map or something that came out uh, based on how racist are states. And they based it on search queries. And the thing is, when you're in your house alone, you tend to say the truth more when nobody's around when you're searching. So that gave a, better, a deeper insight into how somebody actually feels versus what they think they should say, what they, what, how they feel they're going to be judged if somebody's asking them over the phone or in, in person. So I think the, the environment in which you're in when you get asked that question, in addition to how the question's framed and all that stuff, plays a big role in how, how like, useful the data will be. All right. I just wanted to add something about um, Fulbright because we administer scholarships and grants and it's not just about the numbers of scholarships that we administer, it's more um, about the story and kind of what you do with that, that scholarship or that grant. Um, so maybe in country or after, which is why it's so great that we have alumni networks like the, the New York chapter here. But I think that I'm kind of biased, I don't really like numbers and I look more for the qualitative storytelling and I do run all of our social media accounts, so I'm looking for Instagram pictures and blog posts and testimonials, um, and I, I feel like that sort of conveys the story better. So I, I always shy away from big data, which is why I was interested to hear you all speak tonight um, for, for suggestions on that. So just a little too sensible. Right. Can I say two Thank more you. things to complicate? Sure, this? sure, you <laughs> absolutely can complicate. Um, one thing that we have done or talked about is, um, or I myself have, um, basically uh, quantitative and the distinction between quantitative and qualitative data and I mean we also probably all agree that it's actually not that easy quantitative data can very quickly become qualitative and um, a lot of researchers on that front already find these distinctions um, basically not useful anymore because where the boundary um, is crossed is very complicated. And coming back to uh, your point, data visualization in and of itself, of course, also always creates a bias. Yeah. Data that is visualized in a different way will also have um, a different impact and how we understand it um, will be very different, which also has been extensively um, investigated. Yeah, and just to add to that, I think um, it's wonderful to see the goals around visualization, around the data collection and insights. And I think that's that's an area we're really focusing on now, looking at, you know, and let's hear it for small data too. You know, I think looking at the frame or the lens of social media and sentiment analysis and, and all these things, but, um, you know, in a lot of the generative artwork that we were playing with and um, plugging in real-time data and seeing that as a both you know, utility tool for understanding, interpreting, but art, uh, you know, as its own, um, in its own right, a kind of art that has a utility. And, and that seems to be kind of a potential for, you know, the future of data, data visualization that's very rich, very much about our cultural <laughs> mirror reflections, whether it's through, you know, moving image or um, biofeedback data, all these things, but to imagine what, 
those rich visualizations might be. We're all, as humans, um, visual communicators and, and brilliant at pattern detection. And I think the art in the arts and visual artists especially um, that are also working in code and starting to kind of explore these um, areas, I think let's, let's watch that space and kind of see how they're um, framing and reflecting the world around us because it can really help inspire how we as organizations, practitioners, I think can help present that kind of work. Thank you. So I'm going to take another question from our insight box, and this one is about contentious points. What have some of the most contentious points been when doing your study or a project? I'll answer that question. <laughs> um, so for us, one of the big issues right now that we're dealing with with the study is that we need a control group. But for us to do not just a baseline study but a control group, then I mean, we're working with street kids, so what are we going to do? Are we going to go on the street and measure kids and then say, okay, you know, you did really poorly and we're not going to allow you to access our program because we need you as our control group. <laughs> like, so how do we actually get that control group in an ethical way? And at this point, I think we don't really have an answer. We have some other ideas that we're going to explore and maybe we're going to wait list a group and then after they, they serve as our control group, then they automatically enter the, in the program. But it's been a really difficult issue for us to deal with because we need that to, to make the, the data study valid. But at the same time, on a cultural context, it could be really destructive. Anjali, did you want to say something towards that? Um, no, well, I can speak as far as our survey goes. One of the interesting things that we come up with um, a lot, against a lot in the field is whether the data is representative enough. Um, it's a you know different type of uh, project from yours, Rebecca. But we you know we do a, a wide cross section of outreach to nonprofits across the country, and you know nonprofits come in all shapes and sizes. And so assessing whether that d data set is the right one to make a decision and is representative of the sector comes up all the time. You know we get we have calls all the time with other academic institutions that sort of challenge that, but there's this tension between how quickly you want to do a survey, what your sample size should be total, versus you know, how representative of the sector it is. So it's, it's an interesting, again, there's no such thing as a perfect data set, but I did want to say for your question, Rebecca, it's, it's really fascinating. We work with a lot of clients on our, um, personally, like, within our organization, through our pay for success work, um, which is looking specifically at that issue and how organizations who are looking to try and prove their impact and actually quantify it are being asked by the government and by private funders to prove it through controlled studies. Yeah. And so a lot of organizations, particularly in the social services sector in the United States, are dealing with that same challenge of how, how to show the effect of their services without compromising their ethics. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And going beyond control groups, I think ethics is one of the most contentious uh, points in looking at um, data. You know, how much can you actually um, publish, for example, mm -hmm. and what is an ethical um, use of data? I think you fairly quickly, at least in some areas, run into those issues. So all good points, and uh, Anjali, I'm actually interested in how you answer that when uh, faced with the question of, is this survey, is this data actually representative? Like, how do you yeah, we, conclude um, that? It's, yeah, it's totally, we get it a lot, and actually, one of the things that we usually say to folks is it's a compromise. That, again, there's no such thing as a, a perfect data set, but we have made the choice, our organization has made the choice to do that, our survey, annually on time within a month in the same time frame every single year for the last seven years. And we've grown our data set from 900 respondents in our first year to 5,400 in our last year we did this, 5,450. And the only way that we've been able to achieve the scale that we've achieved, which is the highest of any other, we don't, we're the highest um, sort of response rate in the sector, is by doing it within a very tight burst of time over every single year without fail. And an academic institution who is doing a far more rigorous study cannot do that. They cannot achieve our numbers, and they cannot achieve it in the time frame. And so that's the compromise. The scale has been the result of a choice made around not controlling our um, sample size and controlling the study. So. I'd like to also explore, speaking along those lines, um, the 
idea of how to close the gender bias gap around different kinds of research. So there's been a lot of research around gender gaps and that different surveys that had data has been collected um, has been largely biased uh, towards male and different eth uh, specific ethnicities, right? So um, I would pose the question, how do we close that gap in the gender research and the data that's, that's out there? I know <laughs> this is, but this project be another lab is dealing with gender bias and I, I, you know, I think in terms of the experience itself, you can watch the video online and see some of it, um, but so much of the space right now, I think we're women in technology and um, speaking a little bit about the space and the level playing field that it should be for diversity and inclusion, I think it's a, it's a wider kind of um, more complex problem culturally around uh, gender and diversity. Um, but these particular, I think this is really interesting that these artist investigations are coming out of um, kind of anti-disciplinary uh, research groups and collectives, you know, that are looking to change a broader sense of the the kind of gender bias issue or, or in the research case, I can't really speak to that so much, but the projects that I've been witnessing are really tackling some really complex um, areas around that and collecting data too to understand change behavior um, going through embodied narrative experiences. Yeah, it takes an, I think um, it really takes an effort to also go into different demographics, neighborhoods, collect different um, data rather than some of it is actually derived secondhand through um, organizations rather than on the ground. I think that's where a lot of bias um, comes from. Uh, so I think that actually could, be, could become more balanced through a really concerted um, effort, which often isn't made. Yeah. Right, right. I, I, would, I would agree that. I would, I would confirm that if it was a concerted <laughs> effort made. Um, so let's see any confirm or complicate if a more concerted effort was made around sort of research and data collection for uh, to close that gender bias. Confirm or complicate. <laughs> <laughs> we have some shy people around. <laughs> okay, Piero, how... <laughs> What are some of your thoughts around confirming that? Um, um, can you rephrase the question? <laughs> it was just the thought that if more concerted efforts were made around closing that gender gap, around closing um, the gap where uh, collections are being made um, and putting a focus on, on that gender bias itself. Um, like, I guess that wasn't so, so much clearer, but basically, if we put a concerted effort around um, the gender bias and addressing it, um, do you confirm or complicate that, so? I mean, I think, you know, I think I confirm it. Like, I mean, it's just, hmm. I don't know that I can phrase that, sorry. No, it's okay, because there's somebody behind you who's very, very enthusiastically <laughs> wanting to complicate that. <laughs> No, I think it's complicated because I think, in a way, we'd have to change the entire way people think about gender. So women would have to be more comfortable being open with how they feel. And younger women, I think, are starting to feel that and do feel that way. But you get above a certain age and people are still resident. So even if you make that effort, it, the change has to come from within and with, within society as a whole rather than the gathering process, I think. Yeah, and, and I would also complicate <laughs> that issue as well. Um, I, f I feel like there's like so much being done around that and, and it's a very, it's, it is a very complicated issue. Um, Gallup did a lot of studies around gender bias, or not, not just even gender bias, but just sort of um, pre-survey bias. I think one example that they use a lot is where they took two groups of Asian women and they gave them both a test, but in one, in the control group, they didn't say anything before the test was taken, and in the other group, they asked them one simple question. What is your life like as an Asian American female in the United States? 
And it was interesting because in the group that was asked that question first, before they took the test, their scores were markedly lower for whatever reason. So I think just even having like a, a question that frames your thought before you go in to take a survey, and that speaks also towards you know how questions are asked and what kind of answers are given, um, or what you know how it's being framed before you even the information that you're being given before you even sit down and take a survey or are given a test. That kind of a thing is is really really interesting. So I would say that yes, I agree that you know. Concerted effort should definitely be, be, you know, be made around it, and you know, certain lens, the lens at which we look at things should be looked at itself. Um, but I also agree with you in that it's a much bigger question. It's a much bigger socioeconomic question. Okay, so let's open it up. Um, these last couple of questions, just to you know, free form audience questions. If anyone has any thoughts around, yeah, sure, yeah. Um, this question is for Anjali specifically. Um, going back to the survey data that you were showing earlier, I was wondering if perhaps part of the reason that the arts are behind on that outcome-based approach mm -hmm. is because it might be harder to, to quantify the short-term value of the arts as opposed to something like a homeless shelter where people might get out in a few months and have, and have a job. So I wondered if that was part of the issue maybe there. Yeah, absolutely. The arts are at a significant disadvantage in the funding environment when it comes to this. And you know, Rebecca's example is very unique. Most arts organizations haven't been able to show that. You know, you have I guess sort of your your model reminds me a little bit of Harlem RBI, which is another organization in New York that uses sports, uses the love of baseball effectively as a tool to get organizations to enter a charter school. And so most of the organizations within the arts community that are kind of a little further along have integrated arts with another field, particularly education where they're starting to see, where they're able to sort of show that measured change in particularly children's lives. So we see in our survey, we asked a question particularly around audience engagement activities. And one of the things that you see arts organizations doing increasingly is working with schools, um, building out arts education programs, um, and doing more participatory art to try and see how that they can kind of have a more tangible way to seek to show the proof of their sort of impact on their communities. Um, the other thing we see is through community development. And I, I know that Josephine has worked a lot um, with placemaking organizations. But as a community development organization, um, the other way that arts are challenged to prove their impact is in how they change the economic environment in a community. And anyone here in New York can say without, you know, pause that the arts are a significant reason why New York has changed and become revitalized over time across all of its neighborhoods. Yet, nonetheless, they're ha they haven't come up with a model to show that change in a way that directly ties it to art. So that is a very high potential area through placemaking initiatives um, to show impact. But Rebecca's model is unique. And I, I also want to add to this, this is such a deeply cultural issue. Um, I think we need to add in the US to everything that we just said, because in Europe you wouldn't need to justify the cultural value of art as much as you need to do it here. And while I completely agree with all you say, there's also the huge danger of reducing the impact to art, oh, community development, business, economics, you know, ultimately you kill art with, if that is really the, um, the way you measure the impact of the art, art dies in the process, you know. Well, you know, I, one thing, I totally agree with you, as a, as a fine artist also, I completely agree with you, but what's sort of fascinating is that you're dealing with a funding environment where organizations have to choose between an arts organization and a homeless shelter. And it is a hard case to make to a funder that when you have those choices, when you have limited funding, so you know, as an artist, I totally agree with you, but it's so interesting sitting on the other side, the hard choices that organizations are making in their funding are not, it's, it's, it's so hard, so it's complicated. Yeah. <laughs> I, would, I would agree too on that it's very complicated uh, because I know that uh, when I was on my Fulbright in, in Amsterdam, I very much saw that there weren't these 
um, finite si silos that people were placing themselves to, like, oh, it's science or it's art. It was very blended, and people did look at it as um, sort of having crossovers and a lot of impacts across sectors. So you would have, you know, cognitive scientists working with choreographers and things like that. So that that I, I do absolutely agree with Christian in that, um, you know, you know, putting in the U.S. is is definitely could be could be a helpful definition there, and that over in Europe it's certainly certainly less siloed. Um, but also um, to speak towards what Anjali is saying, that um, looking at just the way that foundations overall are funding things is just like it, it is so 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 deeply cultural. It's just like it sort of f forces you to put things in silos that aren't in silos. So I'd love to hear from the audience whether they agree with this or not. <laughs> okay, so let's hear from somebody who hasn't. Um, so sitting next to Ronit, your name? Melody? Melanie. Hi, I'm Melly. Um, and yes, it's, it's, it's very complicated. Um, one of the things that we talked, I'm doing museum education studies at the moment, and one thing that we talk about is nonprofits who do arts, like arts programming and do arts access. It's like, how do you show the importance on, on making sure that art is accessible to a six-year-old who's learning to read and learning, you know, their, and their vocabulary and how, what the impact is. And so there are ways for qualitative analysis um, as well as quantitative analysis, but what's most important is really the qualitative side of it. Um, but it's hard when you're trying to pitch to an organization who also has to, you know, maybe donate to, you know, creating opportunities for people to have food or, or organizations who are working with like building housing. Um, so yeah, it's very complicated <laughs> is the short answer. I wanted to just before Mark, just to add to that, I mean, just speaking around big data and hopefully the change for the funding, you know, certainly the difficulties there, but I think through you know, storytelling with data, I think for many organizations is a wonderful way to um, be able to bring to, to light many of the successes and the outcomes and giving, a, again, a lens, a kind of into individual um, artists or at the community level. But I think that's a, 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 an interesting way to, to kind of focus on um, being able to make a case for um, on the funding side. Um, I also think just there's a change in data science itself. You know, I think you mentioned the mathematician and, you know, there's, that's being totally disrupted um, right now, I think, by the fact that um, there is just such a convergence um, that exists now between, you know, art, science, technology, and storytelling in many ways um, that the hope is that you can look at a much more um, broader and kind of richer way to define what is impact. Um, again, I think it's just more of a change and, and a paradigm shift in our age of kind of information and big data that we have to take into consideration. So take, let's take one more question from Pornay. Okay, Pornay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Purnamal. Change the context a bit to India. And I was working with folk practitioners in an urban city who were trying to uh, reclaim their identity and their place in the city's narrative. And we were doing surveys, and those surveys were given to us by the government, and those centralized surveys which make absolutely no sense in different contexts. And then the community themselves developed their own survey to you know, bring out their points and their concerns, which the government considered to be highly biased, and hence those surveys were, con were not considered mm -hmm. in the final project, and the community's voices were eventually not heard. So what I've been trying to figure out, is there a midway? Because I feel that it is important to involve communities in this process. It is important to involve them in not just doing the survey, but developing those questions because they are the ones who really know what the concerns are. So are there any models that we could look at for that? Or is there a midway that the communities do their bit and then there's someone who can translate it in the language that the government can understand? Mm -hmm. Is there any way for that transition? It's a really good question. Yeah, I, think, I think it's really just a, a matter of establishing uh, infrastructures and 
That is something that is often done here on a community level or in educational institutions in things like uh, participatory action research in issues where you go to the community first and assess what the, what the parameters are and then that gets translated rather than imposing a questionnaire or something pre-configured onto them. Yeah. Um, but that, again, is really a, um, also a question of cultural infrastructure. I mean, research institutions are very open to that or it comes natural to them. Then governments, depending on where they are, very often aren't. Yeah. I had one um, comment. Um, I would say iteration and scale. Um, what's sort of interesting is that, you know, going out gate with a very large project is never, it's gonna be overwhelming and to a lot of work. But if you start very, very small and you learn from what you did and then grow it a little bit, learn from what you did and grow it, it sounds almost like, it sounds almost like you, they took on too much at once. And if you start at a very small scale and allow yourself the iter iteration, the process of iteration, it might, it might go differently. Yeah. There's also a wonderful organization called DataKind, who's um, bringing together kind of data for social good and, and bringing together um, data scientists into the social sector and to culture and art organizations. They're just, in the last year, have started to work with art organizations to help with the data science aspect and um, visualization. So I think that's um, organizations like that and even locally, you know, to find those kind of um, groups that are, um, looking, you know, the open data kind of community and the data philanthropy movement is a, another interesting lens into um, feedback, a kind of a good feedback loop to kind of constantly have a discussion around changing that kind of policy that's maybe not working at a local level. I think, too, this is a, probably a good time to point out that um, within New York, and I know it's a growing movement, too, is a, there's a beta NYC group that does civic hacking around open, open data. Um, so if you look up just beta NYC, B-E-T-A NYC, um, you'll find either the meetup group or the website itself. Um, and they meet, I believe, every Wednesday, like every month mm -hmm. on a Wednesday. Um, and they look at open government data and different kinds of data sets and like how to hack into them such that they start to make patterns and meaning out of it. So I feel like that's a good group to tap into around models, you know, workable models. And then I would also like to point out the Cultural Data Project, which um, uh, Beth Tuttle, who's the um, CEO of, couldn't be here tonight, but um, she sent her regards and she's doing some really interesting work. I believe you can just find it at culturaldataproject.org or something. Mm -hmm. CDP? C yeah, so well, that's something that we can follow up on too with you all if you're interested in having more information about that. But they have been doing a large amount of work around cultural data sets. And so I feel like that kind of organization is good to look at in terms of models and, you know, um, interpretations and things like that. So um, I'll pose one more question and we'll just go down the line. Um, and it's just to wrap things up, um, how, cause, how can we as communities support, how, how can we as women in technology and art and science support impactful art communities and how can those communities support women in technology? Either one. <laughs> how can we as women in technology support, it's, it's complicated, how can we as women in technology support uh, community, how can we as women in technology support impactful art? And how can those communities support women in techno technology? Either one. I, I we can, can start. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I've been diving into virtual reality, which is pretty much a male-dominated space. It's been quite interesting to be one of 10 women at a meetup group of 1,000 people. And I've met some of the veteran uh, women in from VR from the early 90s and um, uh, Jackie Jacqueline Ford Marie um, who's a chief scientist um, at all these worlds she you know she mentioned early on uh, she's writing the history of VR right now and in the early days of, of the space um, she did a, a survey of the first hundred artistic experiments in virtual reality and 70 percent of them were women-led um, 
uh, projects. And she, she really inspired me with her words by saying, you know, as a woman in technology, um, kind of diving into a place and working with teams and kind of um, that sense, I think, putting yourself in maybe uh, areas, whether it's technology or within community or meetup groups or otherwise, um, that's outside of your either comfort zone or there's curiosity. Um, you know, participation is kind of key. And I think supporting arts and, and uh, organizations that are creating that kind of community of impact, um, I think it really just comes down to kind of a, a conversation around innovation and constantly looking to connect, uh, have a, as much diversity and, and networking around um, connecting communities to um, other disciplines or other organizations completely outside of those silos um, to arrive at sometimes solutions that are um, appropriate for, for that organization or community that might come in a very surprising ways. Um, I would say in order to create that sort of like symbiotic relationship that it comes back to one of the first points that was made that you know it's up to us to, to explain why we're doing this and why it's important and what it's telling us. So in our particular case, I mean, the reason that we want to measure these kids that are a part of our program is so that we can advance them through the program and get them to jobs and get them to school as fast as possible and not waste their time, but also not push them ahead before they're ready. So if we can explain that to our funders, but also to the, the community right there, to the kids themselves, why we're doing this, then I think we necessarily get their buy-in. And from our side, then we get their support, and that's what we need to push it forward. So I think it's up to us to articulate to the communities why we're doing it. I agree. I think what's so um, intimidating about your question is that it's so big. How can you change the world? <laughs> and um, it's, as usual, you know, one step at a time, at a time, really working within the framework you're embedded in or putting yourself into a position where you have agency and um, you can affect um, communities. And another thing that is so important, I think, is um, support and showcase other women in these positions because that very often also isn't the case. Yeah. Um, I think what I would say maybe to this question is um, to influence the data sector to be open. I think that would be what I would say. We are seeing in our work, you know, our survey analyzer is open to the public. Um, a lot of organizations are now basically putting data behind gates. Um, they are charging for it. Um, and so, you know, coming from the nonprofit sector, I would say as, you know, in a nonprofit sector that is actually typically majority women and coming from a technology sector that is typically majority men, <laughs> what we can do is actually merge those two things a little bit better. Um, the, those of us that are on both sides of that can actually influence data to be more community-based. And I think that's such an important um, point you bring up that access um, to data also creates new forms of digital divides. If we don't have access to it, then a lot of the research and potential for change will fall flat. Thank you. Yeah, I would say, I would agree. All of those are really good points, and I would totally agree that um, it is a big question. It's a huge question. Um, and I would also say that the answer isn't simple, but to look at if I ask myself the question, to look at things um, in terms of how can we do, how can we do one thing today? Like what is one thing that we can do today to change that? And look at it as that one framework, as that one moment and see if we can go forward from there. So it, so essentially like baby steps, but even, even more so just like how can we frame that in the moment? What can we do today? Um, I was in Ukraine last year and the year before doing some tech camps with the State Department and we worked with a lot of teachers and um, social workers and folks that wanted to institute huge change in Ukraine, which is absolutely something that needs to happen. 
So we were looking at this, the one group that I had were um, a lot of teachers that wanted to work with educational games and how can we get educational games um, be put into um, archaic Ukrainian school systems such that the kids get inspired by them. Um, but you know, how can we change the, ar the Ukrainian school system? How are we going to do this? And I was like, okay, well, we're not going to do that today. Um, but what can we do today? And so the rest of the conversation actually revolved around getting the shift, like paradigmatic shifts of like, how can we get projects done by smaller steps? Well, one thing we can do is we can start a Facebook group for Russian speaking Ukrainian teachers that are interested in games. Okay, we can do that today. Right? And then once we started getting them thinking about that, they started thinking about other things. Well, oh yeah, well we can have our own meetup groups in our own communities and villages. And once we do that, oh wow, why don't we talk to the pedagogical institute and we talk to those teachers who are gonna be future teachers. And if we get them excited, then they'll start using it in their after school programs and on and on and on. So I would say it's a huge question that we must always ask ourselves and that we ideally should always start with what can we do today? So thank you all for attending and for your thoughts and for your feedback. And I would say, if you don't know us, please come up and introduce yourselves. We all want to meet you. And drink our wine and eat the food. We don't want to take anything home. So please enjoy um, socializing a bit more. And thank you for attending. Thank you.